should unmute for the sake of the recording here. Um, the reason it, it winds up mattering for, is that for the most part, where we stop writing numbers is going to be what tells us how sure we are of our answer. How confident we are in our measurement is based on how many decimals you write down. So you know, if I told you that it's, it's uh, 11 miles from here to my house, you have an idea, even if it's just intuitively, even if you don't know why, you have an idea of like how accurate that number is. If I say it's 3,000 miles from here to New York City, that also tells you something, right? If I say it's 2,982 miles to New York City, that's not the same as saying it's 3,000 miles, right? I'm conveying something different, even just intuitively, just verbally. And since this is a science class, we have to have procedures for everything so that we're consistent across the board, right? So everybody knows the same rule when it comes to what we're saying when we write down a number. So while it's not the most riveting topic, we're gonna to start with, here's how you measure something. And here's how you know where to round when you, when you do something on your calculator. Um, and we're going to continue to carry that through the whole way through this class. So you'll get lots of practice with it because it is going to seem sort of arbitrary at first, but it should get to be second nature. Uh, and if you really pay attention, you'll start noticing it in, in everything, any number that you have, a digital scale in the bathroom, you know, the, the, your distance on your Apple watch that you walked today has significant figures and uncertainty factored into how it displays things. So you do see this all over the place. It's just a matter of knowing, knowing that you're seeing it. Um, but we'll start with um, any, any questions about last time. I know we didn't really cover a whole lot of material, but any syllabus questions, structure of the class, issues with Canvas? Um, I am totally willing to answer questions about the math, um, the math review. Um, better in lab though. You didn't have lab with me on. Yeah, so hold on to that till lab this afternoon. We'll talk about it then. Um, and as, as along those lines, anything you have questions about from any assignments you're working on, now would be the perfect time to ask them. Um, and uh, also we'll wind up going over any of the problems that people still have questions about um, from the math review. We'll go over them at the beginning of lecture on, on Monday as well. So I have an idea usually about what the most missed, most confusing parts of that math review are. Um, and that'll get, you'll have a chance then to ask any further questions as well. Uh, another question over here, yeah. Um, the, the Thank you. Um, there should be, I, um, if you're on the wait list and you can't see Canvas yet, um, send me an email from your LTCC email and I can add you manually for now while we get registration sorted out. So you'll be able to see everything and, and submit assignments and everything too. All right. Thank you for reminding me. All right. Um, I, it ha does have to be your LTCC email though. For, for you waitlist students because it's tied to your student account here and everything. If I'm gonna add you, I need the right email um, to do that in Canvas, but you will be able to have access by the end of the day today. All right, so just recap what we talked about a little bit. Just talk about the general idea of the scientific method. Um, and what was our, what's the difference between a scientific law and a scientific theory? What happens and what's supposed to happen or why it happens. So theory explains why the law acts the way it does. Right, so they're serving two different purposes. It has nothing to do with the level of support. A scientific theory will never become a scientific law because they're not talking about the same things. Um, anybody think of any other fields that are, uh, might be tied to chemistry or any fields that that y'all are majoring in or studying that um, you're required to take this class um, that we didn't talk about applications yet? Botany. botany? Was it botany? Yeah. 
Um, so botany is a really good one because especially if you want to take botany and apply it, um, a big part of botany is, is understanding why certain, certain plants are used, are edible or not edible, or used for medicine. Um, and understanding what compounds are present is a big part of that. Um, there's a whole field, what's known as ethnobotany, which is the, the study of, it's basically going to different cultures and seeing traditional medicine um, and trying to determine whether or not there's a scientific basis for that. So for instance, Native American tribes um, would traditionally use a willow bark tea um, when somebody had a headache. And it wasn't until much later on that we were able to say, well, willow bark has salicylic acid in it. And salicylic acid, when you boil it in hot water, especially if you boil it in vinegar, um, it converts the salicylic acid to acetyl salicylic acid, which is aspirin. And even salicylic acid in its normal state, um, before it's acetyl salicylic acid, has properties that are anti-inflammatory and, and a, you know, a, a, um, it's the opposite of a local anesthetic, global anesthetic, um, you know, just sort of a mild painkiller. And so they were able to sort of take a traditional remedy apply chemical knowledge to that and figure out, hey, we can actually you know, use this. Um, and so it's, it's very closely tied to botany. And there was actually a guy who, who, um, who took one of the first modern chemi chemistry instruments called a, a gas chromatograph um, on a dugout canoe up the Amazon and basically just took leaves from every plant he found along the way and ran them through this thing and tried to characterize what might have medicinal value. And I want to say there was something like double digits worth of, of uh, pharmaceuticals that were discovered as a result of that, of taking botany and applying chemistry to it. It's a really cool field. Um, and it definitely also hits upon modern medicine as well. Any other random applications? You haven't had a chance to ask me like random chemistry questions on quizzes yet. So this is just a good icebreaker. Animal biology. Well, you want to know how to treat those animals, right? Generally speaking, usually animal biology is, is um, interested in, in helping animals to some extent. But even if you're just studying the animals, understanding why, I don't know, koalas behave the way they do because they're, they're strictly eating eucalyptus and their bodies interact with the eucalyptus leaves a certain way um, that produce certain compounds that basically make them sort of confused and high their whole life. Um, more like confused and hung over their whole life, poor guys. Um, but, you know, understanding why koalas fall out of a tree and get confused as to where their tree went, um, that's because the only thing they have to eat is eucalyptus, and eucalyptus has this effect on koalas. Um, and that's all chemistry, understanding why that happens. And they, it's not like they have a better option. There is nothing for them to eat other than eucalyptus. It's kind of a miserable existence when you when you think about it. Um, but that's, yeah, it's, it's definitely tied to And if you want to, um, another good example that I like to use is uh, why is cat food different than dog food? Um, cat food is different than dog. You can't feed cats dog food permanently. They'll eat dog food. They like the taste of it, but it's lacking certain nutrients. They need taurine added to their diet, cats do. Um, and taurine is not added to dog food. And you can't even feed a cat meat from the butcher um, because taurine gets broken down really, really quickly um, in dead animal cells. It's produced naturally in animal cells, um, but as soon as the animal dies, the taurine concentration degrades really, really fast. So if a cat is going to be able to survive long term, and really it's not surviving, they lose their eyesight, they go blind. Um, if they don't have taurine in their diet. So it's a lot like vitamin A is for humans. Um, if they don't have taurine in their diet, or basically they either have to be eating meat that's like still moving, it's so fresh, or you have to buy cat food that has taurine added to it. Um, if you don't do that, then your cat goes blind and potentially dies long-term. And understanding why that is has to do with the rate of enzymes break down taurine and what taurine is um, physically. So it's, it's definitely, that's a good example of non-human 
nutrition is different than human nutrition, right? We don't need taurine. It's just a marketing tool that's added to energy drinks for some reason. Um, but cats, on the other hand, do. Nothing against energy drinks, but I don't know why taurine's in there. All right. Anybody want to throw one more out there or should we move on? You can ask me questions on your quizzes. Okay, let's talk about numbers. Um, this is where chemistry is going to, chemistry is very heavily dependent on math and numbers and calculations, but where it separates itself from math classes um, is that we don't deal with just numbers. A number on its own is meaningless. Right. If I if I tell you that I'm going to go have five five minute break, five beers, five cheeseburgers, what? Right. You need a unit for a number to make sense. If you don't have a unit, then a number is meaningless. You need context. So the definition of the same thing here is still a Wikipedia definition. A unit is a definite magnitude of a physical quality. So a quality is what you're describing and a definite magnitude is how much you're describing. So I'm gonna go five mile run. That's a distance, right? Like giving a unit inherently gives a, a number more meaning. And even if you don't, if you haven't thought about it before, even if you say a number in everyday life, if you're talking to somebody else and you give them a number, even if you don't say a unit, there's an implied unit usually. Right? And sometimes it's not always clear what that implied unit is. So if you go to the gas station and you go, you go to the, the cashier and you pay in cash, you have to give them a unit. And sometimes it's an implied unit. But if I go up to the cashier and I say, give me 20 on five, it's implied that I mean $20 of gas on pump number five, right? So in that case, the context where I am, what I'm doing is kind of providing the unit, but it's even more clear if I actually tell them what I mean, right? Um, and so that's what we're gonna do in this class. We're never gonna imply a unit in this class. We always wanna be explicit with our units in this class so that somebody reading your paper, whether it's me or somebody you're working with or just developing good habits for the future, nobody could ever read your numbers and, be, and um, not understand what you're talking about, right? Even when you're showing your work, it gets to be a hassle. It's a really good habit to be in to write your units. Every time you write a number, write a unit after it for this class. And there'll be times that will save you um, from getting a wrong answer because you'll realize, oh, I'm supposed to cancel out meters, but this is in feet. I needed to switch from meters to feet at some point. So we need to be paying attention to our units. And I would encourage you to just for the next week over the weekend, anytime you're doing anything, if you're working as a server, you're dealing with units all the time. It's just a matter of a lot of times they're implied, right? And sometimes you do have to be really specific, right? You need to say table five, not five o'clock, right? If you're trying to distinguish between those two things. Um, if you're taking medication or prescribing medication, you need the unit, right? If I say take five ibuprofen, that's different than saying take five milligrams of ibuprofen. Five ibuprofen, I'm probably talking about actual physical tablets. If I say take five milligrams, that's very different just by giving it unit there, right? So milligrams would be the unit there. And more specifically, it'd be, you know, if in a medical setting, it'd be milligrams of ibuprofen because we don't want to administer 400 milligrams of Xanax if really we need 400 milligrams of ibuprofen. I don't even know how many, how many bars that would be. Xanax is like like 20 milligrams per per big tablet, right? So that'd be like, you know, we're talking felony trafficking charges versus two ibuprofen tablets. Um, so being as specific as possible winds up being a big deal. So let's do some some practice with units. This is going to be pretty basic. 
What units do we use for length just in general? Inches, feet, meters, centimeters, miles, furlongs, if you're in the horse racing business. Um, I think they still, furlongs, furloughs, furlongs. I think the Kentucky Derby is like eight furlongs or something like that. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of random units that we don't want to have to deal with confusing them though, right? So for the most part, we're going to stick to some basic fundamental units that are kind of agreed upon not worldwide for the most part, that these are the units that make the most sense so that we don't have to constantly be converting units. Um, and we'll talk about what those are in a minute. Well, weight, <laughs> pounds, ounces, and oh God, ounces and pounds and gills and fluid ounces versus stone and yes, slugs. Um, what are known as uh, imperial units or British units for weight and mass and volume all get really confusing really fast. So for the most part in this class, we're gonna stick to metric units, um, especially for weight and mass, um, because I really hate having to remember that there's two pints and a quart and four quarts and a gallon and 16 ounces and a pint and trying to go all the, you know, those, none of those make sense, right? We're gonna try to stick to mostly base 10 units because it's a lot easier to remember your conversions then. Volume. Liters. What are some, some volume units for, for uh, imperial units? Since that's what most of us in America are used to thinking about. We already said some of them. Pints, pints, gallons, ounces. So one of the reasons why it's tricky with, with imperial units is, is there's ounces or fluid ounces. And they're the same if you're talking about water, but one's talking about a volume and one's talking about a weight. And they're not the same if something has a different density than water. So a fluid ounce of dry flour is gonna have a different weight than a fluid ounce of water. And so to avoid all of that confusion, again, we're gonna avoid that and just stick to using things like liters and, and the units that are derived from that, like milliliters, um, or get into, um, you use cubic meters too sometimes. Time, seconds, and so on, right? Seconds, minutes, hours, days, eons, decades. And actually a year is actually a really interesting unit because a year um, is not an exact time. A year is, is defined by how long it takes us to go around the sun, right? But it's not, a year is not the same every year on a calendar, right? Some years we have leap years, some years we don't. We'll talk about why that is um, and what to do with non-exact numbers. But yeah, time can get a little bit weird, but luckily time is one of those units that, that we don't have to rethink how we, um, how we visualize things in our head, like, like those of us who grew up in the US do for you know, things like meters or Celsius, et cetera. Um, I just gave, gave you an example. What are some other things that have units? Sorry? Temperature, yep. Celsius and Fahrenheit and Kelvin and Rankine and there's actually some more in there too, but what else? Speed. I like speed because speed is a combination of two of these, right? So some of these are what are known as fundamental properties and some of them are actually derived properties. Things like speed are a derived property because they're a combination of what? Time and length. Right. In order to have a speed, you need a distance and you need the time it takes to get to travel that distance. What else is there? Electricity. There's actually a lot of units with electricity. You've got voltage, you've got current, you've got power, which is actually a combination of voltage and current. Actually, you've got, let's see, yeah, no, power is a combination of voltage and current. And then Energy is a combination of voltage, current, and time. 
So, and then there's lots of different ways we can get to energy. There's all sorts of ways to measure energy. Do you know that barrels of oil is actually an energy unit? Um, it's also a volume unit. It's also, you know, it's a, also a measure of, of uh, value. If you know the price of crude oil, then barrels of oil actually has all sorts of different connotations that go with it. Also, technically, tons of TNT is also an energy unit, which is kind of a fun one. Anybody think of anything else? Money. Money is a unit. Temperature. What about radiation? Radiation has, again, has lots of units. There's REMS versus Sieverts versus Curies that depending on what you're measuring, are you measuring how, how much radiation is coming off or are you measuring how much radiation is absorbed by the skin? Those are two different things that have two different units associated with them. But Sievert, off the top of my head, I'm gonna mix these up probably, but I believe Sieverts has to do with absorbed radiation. No, that's RADS. RADS is radiation absorbed dose. Um, has to do with how, what type of radiation it was and how close it was to you and what part of your body did it hit all affect your rad count. Um, yeah, so basically anything that has numbers is gonna have units to some extent. Light has lots of different ways we measure units. There's wavelength of light, but there's also intensity of light. And so wavelength of light get, will determine the color of the light, but the intensity determines how bright it is. You can have a really, really bright red light. And red light's gonna have a longer wavelength, but less energy but it can be higher intensity than a weak blue light. But the blue light has a shorter wavelength. And so there's all sorts of different, different ways we can, we can measure these. Those are the big ones that I like to talk about just for fun. Anybody think anything else? Any, if you're, sound, decibels, pitch. Pitch and sound is just like color for light. Um, our bodies, this is one of the things that's kind of cool about our bodies is our, our senses are basically our, our brain's way of interpreting and measuring physical data from the universe around us. So pitch is the way we interpret vibrations of the air and the frequency, how fast those vibrations are happening is what we perceive as pitch. We are, when you say something in a certain color, you're literally using your eyes to measure the wavelength of that light which is kind of wild to think about. Um, taste and smell are literally measuring the shape of the molecules that are hitting your taste receptors and your, and your, um, your no scent receptors in your nose, which is why some things taste similar to other things, even though they're different molecules. They can still stimulate, the, they're close enough to the same molecular shape that they can stimulate the same um, signals on your taste receptors. Basically, your brain is sequestered from the universe in a jar that we call your skull, and your senses are just the only way that we have of sort of probing the universe around your brain. And kind of just kind of a fun, fun thing to think about. Um, so here's just a list of the common units that we're going to stick with for the most part. We'll also split apart a little bit from, from what I consider physics units. So physics units basically do everything in meters and seconds and kilograms. But a kilogram is kind of a lot in chemistry terms. A kilogram of, of water is like a quart of water. We typically are dealing with things that are a lot smaller than that in chemistry. So we want slightly different units, but they're all going to be based around the metric system. And so in chemistry, we deal, we'll mostly be dealing with centimeters and we do deal with grams, but more milligrams, milliliters, et cetera. Um, and we'll talk about how those prefixes work to modify these in a, in a minute. Um, but it will require you kind of trying to retrain your brain a little bit to try and think in metric units as best you can. Um, I don't expect you to be able to do that you know, off the bat or necessarily all that. Well, I still think in imperial units, and I've been doing this for a long time at this point. Um, there's just not a whole lot you can do about that. If you if you grew up learning imperial units, you're probably going to always think in imperial units. It's sort of like your native language. Um, even if you get good at using centimeters and kilograms, 
you still have to sort of convert it in your head. When somebody says 10 centimeters, my brain immediately turns that into inches in order for me to visualize it. That's normal. It just takes practice to be able to do that and know what those kind of conversions are. All right, so let's talk about measuring numbers. Uh, because we're going to take measured numbers are different than what we call exact numbers. Measured numbers means that there is some uncertainty associated with them. And at their most basic, a measured number is any number where you make a judgment call at some point. So anytime where you have to look at something and say, it, it lines up exactly with that line or it doesn't. And you're making and you're estimating something in your head. That's a measured number, um, and so that can be on a on a scale. If you think about the old um, analog scales at the doctor's office with the you know the little things slide back and forth, that's really easy to see how you're using your estimating things, right? Um, and sometimes it's harder to tell because sometimes the estimating is done for you, is done digitally. So a digital scale is still going to be a measured number. It's just that the scale is making the estimation for you. You're not directly making the judgment call yourself. So whoever programmed that scale, programmed it with that in that estimation built into it. Um, so length, volume, temperature, all really common measured numbers, but weight. Um, and it, essentially you can tell if it's a measured number sort of qualitatively, and this takes some practice, but if, it, if it's a number where adding more decimal points could make it more accurate, it's a measured number. And so if I say that, I don't know, this weighs one pound, but if I had better way of measuring it, it might be 1.1 pounds and I could keep going, right? and get every decimal place I could add would make it a better number, would make it a more accurate number in theory, that's gonna be a measured number. So I think I already said it, what's the opposite of a measured number? Exact. So in other, exact means is the opposite. If you add more decimal places, it will never change what you started with. So those are gonna be things like definitions. Is it about 12 inches in a foot? Could it possibly, could it ever be 12.01 inches in a foot? Maybe, no? Maybe on a, on a ruler, depends if your ruler is not perfect, but sort of that's kind of our definition of a foot is 12 inches, right? Not 12.000 inches, it's just 12, exactly 12. So anytime you've got something where it's, it's a definition, that's an exact number. But if it's not a definition, it's a measured number. And measured numbers have uncertainty associated with them. There's a reason why we don't use fractional scales. Um, because yes, fractions mathematically are exact, but measured are not. So we try to stay away from fractions for that reason. More on that in a second. So sometimes your measured number or the way you measure that number changes how certain you are about it, right? We've all had experiences with, you know, if you're pouring, if you're pouring gas out of a gas can into your car and I say, put one gallon in, You've got to do a whole bunch of estimating. Like, well, I, I guess that's a gallon. Maybe I'm off by a gallon in either direction, right? Maybe that was one, maybe that was really two gallons. If you're at the gas pump though, and I say, put a gallon in, you can get really close, right? Especially if you're patient and, and willing to, to go slow. And so changing how you measure things changes how certain you are about that number. And we can see that too, just by looking at this example here. I'm going to stand in the back so I can see what it looks like here. Okay, when I stand up there, those two don't look, A and B don't look anything like the same length. Those two pieces of, of wood as a picture, um, baked wood, are supposed to be the same length. You can't see B 
and I tell ask you how how many centimeters that piece of wood is, what would you write down? Four and a half. We're trying to stay away from decimal or from fractions. If we want to put that as a decimal, maybe 4.5. Sam? 4.55. Looks like maybe it's just a little bit more than four and a half. But could it be 4. Point, it could be less than 4.5? you can't see B. So we basically, we have the rule for determining how many decimals we can write down is you can only go one decimal place past the digit where you're certain. I think everybody will look at A and say it's definitely between four and five. Nobody's going to contest that, right? I don't have any contrarians in here who will argue that just on principle. Okay. It's okay if you are. I'm a contrarian myself, but... I think we can all agree it's between four and five with absolute certainty. But is it 4.5 or 4.6 or 4.4? That's now we're using our judgment, right? So the first decimal place where you have to use your judgment, where there's uncertainty, is that's the last decimal place we'll write down. So if we're just looking at A, you have to kind of pick, you have to stop writing decimals at the tenths place, 4.5, 4.6. We're not allowed to write down 4.55. Because that's saying, basically what you're saying is that the, whatever the last digit you write down, could, you could be off by one in that decimal place. So if I say 4.5, what I'm telling somebody who reads that number is, I measured 4.5, but it could be 4.6. If you write down 4.55, you're telling the reader, I could only be off by a hundredth of a centimeter. If I wrote, I measured 4.55, but maybe it's 4.56. Right, so the digit where you stop writing is where you have that uncertainty. And you're always plus or minus one in that last reported digit. This is exactly why we stay away from fractions, right? So even if you estimate it in your head as a fraction, you have to turn that fraction into a decimal with the right number of decimal places. If it looked like it was four and a quarter, you wouldn't write down 4.25. You have to choose 4.2 or 4.3, right? Because if you say 4.25, that's telling them that you're more certain than you are. If we change the ruler, so now let's, same piece of wood, let's look at, sorry, go ahead. So when you make a judgment call, do you want it to be lower or higher? We take, basically you're assuming that sometimes you're gonna be high and sometimes you're gonna be low, but it'll average out. Ideally, if we really cared about this number a lot, we really, but we only had the ruler from A, we would take the piece of wood and the ruler and we'd have everybody in the class measure it and write down their numbers and we'd average everybody's measurements out. And that get, would give us a higher degree of certainty that it's 4.5 versus 4.6 because some of us will, at, will estimate it being too big and some will estimate it being too small. But it'll follow a bell curve shape and the average measurement will be right in the middle. So, and we'll do the same thing with rounding will follow standard rounding rules, but it, again, it follows that statistical model. Sometimes we're going to round up when we shouldn't, but sometimes we'll round down when we shouldn't, and those will average each other out over time. So if we switch from the ruler from A to looking at B, all of a sudden we can measure things a lot better, right? Just by changing the ruler, we can actually all agree now, again, it gets a little bit harder if everybody walked right up in front and stared at it. So, well, it's definitely between 4.5 and 4.6. Nobody's going to disagree with that. We have the markings for, for, for every tenth of a centimeter. And we can definitively say it's between 4.5 and 4.6. There's no uncertainty in the tenths place anymore, right? By switching the ruler, we actually get to write an extra decimal place now because now you're using your judgment in the hundreds place. Everybody will say 4.5 something, 
and then we're estimating 4.56, 4.57, 4.55. And there's absolutely no way that any of us could be off by a whole tenth of a centimeter because we use the better ruler, right? So the rule for writing, the, for writing down numbers is first, only use a decimal scale. We're not gonna be dealing with fractional scales. And decimal scale means all 10 of the, of the increments are measured out for you. If it's a fractional scale, fractional scales mean is what we're used to using for tape measures and stuff from the, from the hardware store or even, even uh, baking, right? Your measuring cup probably has half, half of a, a cup or and three quarters of a cup. Fractional scales are not what we want to use in the sciences because fractions are complicated for starters. And two, when you convert fractions into decimals to do math with them, you wind up with an issue with rounding, right? So how do you take four and a quarter and put it into tenths? You know, that's got issues with it, right? So basically, if we see fractional scales in this class, we're going to ignore them. Pretend like those fraction lines aren't there. Which means sometimes if you're using a ruler that has, that's a fractional ruler, you have to only write down uh, two measured numbers, even though it seems like with all those fraction lines on it, you should be able to get better numbers, more certainty. Not for this class, but I'm not gonna make you learn two different ways of measuring. There's a whole different scale and rules for measuring fractions. And I'm, we're just gonna say, don't do that. No fractional scales, only decimal scales. And all 10 of the numbers have to be written, all, I guess, nine lines in between one and two have to be written out. If that's not the case, if it has a marking for every other, for every other 10, then that's not a fraction or that's not a decimal scale. And you can't use those. They're helpful sometimes, but you can't consider that certainty. And so in science and engineering, only decimal scales. Um, American engineers still do things in inches, but they use decimal scales to do it. So you can actually buy tape measures uh, and rulers and things like that that measure tenths of an inch. They're just not what's commonly available in schools for whatever reason. Um, and that's, that's really common in the engineering world. Only decimal scales. No fractional scales, only decimal scales, okay? If it doesn't have all the markings, you can't use it. So here's our procedure for measuring a number. You start by writing down the most accurate number that you know with absolute certainty. So basic, and that's almost always going to be till you run out of decimal markings. Because as long as you have markings for every 10, Everybody will agree on it. You know with absolute certainty where it is. And then you estimate one more decimal place. Right? So you always need to be using your best judgment to write that last digit. When as soon as you get to a digit, a decimal place where you're estimating or guessing, that's your last number that you can write down. So what will we write down for C? Looks like it's right at the line, right? Looks like three centimeters on the nose. But if we just wrote down three centimeters, we're implying that it could, we could be off by a whole centimeter, right? 3.0. There's no way that it's actually two or four centimeters. So we don't want to write just three. We say 3.0. But even though that doesn't change anything mathematically, the fact that you're writing that zero is telling the reader, I measured that number. I measured that decimal place, really. And I'm only off by one in that tenths place at the most. And so anytime you get something that looks like it's right on a line, you're probably going to have to write something 0 0.0 or 0 0.50. So just to walk through this one more time, if we're measuring A, 
we know it's between four and five. We know that the one's place, we're not off by a whole centimeter. Then we estimate one more decimal point. So 4.5. For, for, for B, 4.56 or 4.55. For C, we'd get, we'd write down the whole thing or the number we know with certainty. Oh, they didn't fix this over. All right, well, that stylus is not gonna be useful then today. Um, we know with certainty the ones place, we're not off by a whole ones place. So we write 3.0 centimeters, one period of unit. This is a lot of time spent on something that seems like the pretty elementary skill. Um, but I will tell you right now, writing down the right number, number of decimal points is going to be the number one thing I mark people down on for this whole class. Um, not that will be like the, the single thing that causes people to not get it an A, but like you, it would be very rare for anybody in this class to turn in any assignment where you don't make a single mistake on sig figs. When we start doing math, when we start rounding, there's so many places to round and make an error. You're gonna mess up at some point in every assignment. I've never had anybody turn in a perfect test. And it's not a humble brag about how hard my classes are or anything. No, it's just that there are too many places to mess up. I couldn't take one of my tests and get it 100% right on every single sig fig in a time situation. So do the best we can. Try to make it second nature. I should say, I, I couldn't do that as a student. By now, I probably could. Probably. And so the reason I keep emphasizing this is because it'll keep coming back. Um, and really, it's more with the math and the measuring. You can get the measuring skills down pretty quickly. But writing down the right number of significant figures is where people mess up all the time. And so that's, if you ever see me mark something on your paper as just you know, minus a quarter of a point, SF means sig figs, significant figures. Just means you didn't round in the right spot somewhere, right? And that's, I need a stamp that I can use for that because that's the one that shows up every single assignment for every single one of you pretty much. Um, at some place. Sometimes I miss them. Sometimes I just decide it's not worth my time to stop and write that and I'll just let it go. But I want you guys thinking about uncertainty and paying attention to where to round because it tells people how good your numbers are. All right, so significant figures, the way we count these when it comes to actually for numbers that somebody else measured or that you measured and then you're going to do some math with it, is we, we, S, or we count how many significant figures they have by looking at how many non-zero numbers do we have? I should preface this for everybody who's been working on the math review this first week. I don't assume you know anything about this. So if you already turned in the math review and you're like, oh shoot, did I measure, did I do my sig figs right? Doesn't matter for this first assignment. You get a pass on sig figs for the first assignment because we hadn't covered this yet. Um, anytime a digit is non-zero, you basically had to have measured it, right? There's no way that you could write down a non-zero number that wasn't measured, right? So you, somebody had to look at a scale at some point to measure that non-zero number. And so we call that a significant figure because it was measured. So if we look at numbers, we say 5.13 centimeters. That has three significant figures. It has three digits that were measured. And we'd say that the uncertainty is in the hundredths place. And we could be, we're not off in the tenths place. We're not, it couldn't be 5.23. The way it's written is implying it could only be off by one digit in the hundredths place. Is, that's the assumption what we're trying to convey to everybody when we write a number like that. Right, so uncertainty and how many measured numbers, how many sig figs are going to be the biggest things that we're looking at. 
if you measured a zero at the end of your number, like our 3.0 example, I still had to measure that. So, well, we measured that zero, right? We said it's right at the three. And we wanted to say it was plus or minus a 10. So we wrote 3.0. That's a measured number. So that means that that digit counts. If you, the only reason to write 5.310 is if I'm trying to tell you where the uncertainty is, right? Mathematically, there's no reason to write that zero there. So if we looked at that number, it would have how many sig figs? Four. Four. So numbers to the left of the decimal still count as well. So all four of those numbers are, are measured. So it'd be four sig figs. If a digit is a zero between two non-zero numbers, really between two sig figs, then it also had to have been measured. And so if I write 5.00 centimeters, well, the second zero tells me that it's plus or minus 100, right? This zero still had to be measured to get there, though, right? So that's still a sig fig. If you have zero in between two other sig figs, that's also a sig fig. You can't have met numbers that aren't measured in between numbers that are. I don't, I, I, I don't really like to use absolutes, but I can't think of a case where you could ever have that be, right? If you're measuring the front number and the back number, the ones in the middle have to be measured too. So 5.04 would be three sig figs. And here's the one that always gets, here's an absolute. If you write it in the coefficient for scientific notation, then by definition, you're saying this number was measured. That is your foolproof. There is no question about whether it's a sig fig or not. If you write it in scientific notation and it's a number that you wrote down, it's measured. Otherwise you shouldn't write it down. So we said 5.0 times 10 to the five. How many sig figs is that? Just two, just these ones. The other decimals behind that, if I actually wrote this out in, in longhand, it would be 500,000. The other zeros, these zeros, are just there to show me where the decimal place is. Basically, how big the number is, right? The only ones that are measured are those two. So if we say 5.0 times 10 to the 5, it only has two significant figures, or if we, the other way of saying is the uncertainty is in this place, where the first zero is. We're saying that this number could be off by 10,000 centimeters. And so these two are measured, the rest aren't. And that's one of the big reasons to use scientific notation is to make that really explicitly clear. Because if I say that the speed of light is Two hundred ninety-eight million meters per second. Where's the uncertainty? Because we have this whole bunch of zeros behind here that are probably just placeholder zeros. It would be a reasonable assumption to say that's plus or minus um, is that plus or minus a million meters per second. But technically, this is poorly written. You should never write a number like this because it's not clear. What if I actually did measure that spot and the placeholder zeros start there? And right? so if you write it in scientific notation, you don't have that issue because you can say 2.98 times 10 to the eight meters per second. And it becomes really, really explicitly clear. The uncertainty is on the eight. 
I could be off by one in that decimal place. Written like this, this is what's called an ambiguous number. An ambiguous number is any number where you don't know what the uncertainty is based on how it's written. Okay, and so a lot of times the other most common correction that I'll say is if you write a number like this as your answer, I'll just write A and B, which means ambiguous. Occasionally when I'm writing example problems, I'm going fast and I'll write an ambiguous number. Um, I usually catch that when we do the examples in class and say, let's assume that there's this many sig figs. But basically you have to make an assumption about it if it's not clearly written. If you wanted to write it out longhand instead of scientific notation and still make it clear, you actually have to write the uncertainty. You can write plus or minus one million meters per second. If you write plus slash minus like that, that means that's uncertainty. I could be off by this much. Now it's not ambiguous because that tells you where the uncertainty is, right? It tells you it's right here. And so that's a lot of writing though. It may be an extra step while you're getting used to scientific notation again or for the first time, but this is a lot more convenient than having to write out your uncertainty every single time, especially when we start dealing with big numbers. Questions about counting sig figs? Easy enough, right? So why are we spending so much time on this? Because I'm gonna mark you down on it so many times. Um, And counting sig figs is where we know how we know where to round. Okay, so we'll go through this. Uh, actually, we'll take a break first. Let's take a break, come back at five after. We'll review by doing this, and then I'll show you why it actually matters. Do we have to turn that in on Canvas or do we bring in a physical copy? So on Canvas, please. Okay.
Okay, so it'll so the lab will be every every Wednesday. Um, so are, is it just gonna be this week or? Okay, in Wednesday. That that'll be okay because it's a it's an assignment you can do on your own, especially if you know how to um, scan something and submit it as a PDF in Canvas. Then you should be fine. Okay, thanks for checking. What's your name? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Very good. Thank you. <laughs> All right, as we're getting back in here, we'll take a look at these numbers and count both how many sig figs they have and what the uncertainty is. So you're not counting the uncertainty, but describe the uncertainty um, of each of these. Just I'll give you a second and then we'll start working through them.
shouldn't take too long, right? I think we all met, mastered counting back in kindergarten or first grade. Um, maybe, maybe second if you were a late bloomer like me. So how many sig figs on the fastball? Two. What's the uncertainty? One, the last reported number is where the uncertainty is. You could be off by a whole meter per second. It's worth noting the, the uncertainty is gonna have the same units as whatever you're measuring too, right? So if we're measuring speed in meters per second, our uncertainty will be meters per second. If you're being careful, you, you could have cases where your uncertainty was not the same units, but it wouldn't make much sense, right? If I say it's 5.25 miles plus or minus a foot, that's kind of a silly thing to do, right? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do it that way. Um, 48 meters per second doesn't seem like all that fast until you consider that the distance from pitching mound to home plate is only about half that distance. So you get roughly half a second between when it leaves the pitcher's hand and when it when it crosses home plate um, to decide both where you're, if you're going to swing and where you're going to swing. It's really, really fast in terms of uh, needing to make decisions. Um, speed of sound at sea level. Where, how many sig figs? Five. Where's the uncertainty? Hundreds place. You could be off by 0.01. That's different than the speed of light that I wrote up on the board a few minutes ago, right? But I did stop writing when I got to the to that same place, right? The hundredths place when it was in scientific notation. Um, because that's where I could not remember the number off the top of my head anymore. So when you're estimating things just in your head, these rules still apply. I was off, I wrote 2.98. Um, but this number is 3.00. That's with what we call within the realm, the same uncertainty. It's the same number for the purpose of uncertainty. Is there a question over here? Okay. So how many sig figs? Three. And it's tough to say where the uncertainty is unless you write it out longhand, um, at least while you're still getting used to scientific notation. You could say that the, the uncertainty is plus or minus 0 0.01 times 10 to the eight, which would really be, if we simplified that and put the one to the left of the decimal place, that'd be one times 10 to the six, right? Which is a million, which is what we talked about earlier with speed of light. Um, and I'm gonna try to use the stylus a little bit that they updated something here so that now when I write with the stylus on the screen here, it shows up about half an inch away from where I write. So it makes it really hard to write in a straight line or at the same size or any sort of consistency. So please excuse my bad penmanship um, if I am gonna use this. And we don't wanna forget our units there. So three sig figs in our uncertainty would be we wouldn't say it's in the hundredths place unless we qualified that with in the hundredths place in scientific notation, or you would want to sort of simplify that. But that becomes less the biggest deal when it comes to knowing the uncertainty is when we actually want to do math with it. We don't actually have to write the uncertainty explicitly if we're careful with writing down our numbers. Um, but it makes a difference when it comes to doing math. And so here's some practice with scientific notation um, that we'll, I'm going to save this for now. Because sig figs in calculations is what I want to get through today, because I want you to see this. You'll probably need to see this a few times before it really sinks in. So I want one of those times to be today. So keeping track of the number of significant figures is the number one way we know how to round when we do math with a number. Right, because if we know where the uncertainty is when we start, after we do some math with it, we need to also be able to say where the uncertainty is in our answer. If our measured number that we're starting with could be off by 100 feet, then, we know, then our answer is going to be able to be off by a certain amount as well.
right? So when we're adding or subtracting, our final answer needs to have the same uncertainty as our least certain measurement. And I'll say that again, and I'll give you some examples. Our measured number, our calculation result needs to have the same uncertainty as our least certain number. So the example is what really make that make sense, right? Because if I say that I, I'm gonna go walk to my car and then drive home, those are two different distances. If I wanna know the total distance that I traveled and said, I can measure the distance that I walked to my car plus or minus a foot. But then my distance from my car where in the parking lot to home is plus or minus a mile. And I wanna add those two numbers together. Well, if one of my numbers is plus or minus a mile, when I add them together, my answer has gotta be plus or minus a mile, right? If, I'm, if I know that I'm only off by at most a foot for one of my pieces, and then I'm off by up to a mile in my other piece, my final answer could be off by up to a mile. And so here's an example with the same two figures from earlier. If, let's say for some silly reason, because I needed to come up with an example here, um, you're using two different rulers to measure two pieces of wood. The same two pieces of wood we measured earlier, so you might even have these measurements written down. What is the length for the first piece of wood? The right number of decimals? 4.5 is where we're certain. And then we estimate one spot past that, right? So we'll call it 4.55 centimeters. What's our distance for the second one? Three is where we're certain. And then we go one spot past, right? So 3.0. Our uncertainty for this first one, we're only off by plus or minus a one, right? We could be off by a whole tenth for the second one. So when we add these together, when you plug it into your calculator, what are we going to get? 7.55, right? But if we just wrote that, that's saying we're off by at most 0.01. But this number would be off by a whole ten. So we need to round this. So we can only write the number to the tenths place. So when you add two numbers together, sometimes you lose a decimal place, you lose a sig fig if one of your numbers is no good. Or not as precise the measurements, is a better term. Nothing wrong with this number. It's only being an inferior, inferiority complex. All right, so whatever the uncertain, the larger uncertainty is what your uncertainty needs to be on your answer. Or the other way of phrasing that is keep the same uncertainty as your least certain measurement. Right. Exactly. Right. So the other example that I like to use for this is let's say your friend's driving up here from the Bay Area and he says that I'm going to be four, four and a half hours, 4.5 hours. And then he calls you in Placerville because he got stuck at that traffic light for 15 seconds. I'm going to be, I'm going to be 15 seconds later than I told you. Well, four and a half hours, you plus or minus a 10th of an hour already, right? The extra 15 seconds is not going to change how you think about his ETA, right? Because that 15 seconds is implying plus or minus a second. But 4.5 hours is implying plus or minus a tenth of an hour. And tenth of an hour, we could go through the math there. It'd be plus or minus six minutes either way would be what you're implying there. Um, but it's beside the point. The whole point is that the least certain measurement is the one that's going to control your final answer. And sometimes that means it looks like nothing changed, even though you added two numbers together. And so when it comes to rounding, um, when I say round to the tenths place, that means I want you to stop the decimals at the tenths place. 
and you just use standard rounding if it's five or up, you round up. If, if it's four or less, you round down. Just like you learned that, I don't know, when you first learned rounding, but sixth grade probably, somewhere in there. It's nothing tricky about it. Don't just leap off the end. If I say round to about 10 place, that means it doesn't mean just drop everything after that, you round to the nearest 10. Is that a question? I won't for going forward. I might for for maybe one more assignment because what I want is for you to be able to look at this and know that you need to round to the tenths place. Right? That's why we have these rules so that everybody's following the same rules for rounding. It doesn't depend on what I tell you in the problem. You can just look at it and say, oh, well, my my largest uncertainty is the tenths place, so I'm going to keep my answer to the tenths place. That's the whole point of having this is that everybody in the scientific or engineering world is using the same system for determining where to round. So that we all know when we're sending numbers, we don't have to say, well, was that plus or minus a tenth or plus or minus a hundredth? It's implied the way we write the numbers. All right, so here's some practice. 5.33 plus 4.50 feet. So when you plug it into your calculator, you get 9.83 feet, right? What's our uncertainty on our starting numbers? To what decimal? Hundredths. So our answer needs to keep its decimal to the hundredths. When they're both the same, it's really easy, right? When you have your uncertainty, the same decimal place for both of them, it's really straightforward. Just keep your same decimal. And there really shouldn't be any issues with rounding because that's how addition works. So that's our number, our answer. If we say 6.0 gallons minus 0.08 gallons, when you plug that into the calculator, you get 5.92. And where's our, our largest uncertainty is in the, it's in the 6.0, it's in the tenths place. So we need to round this to 5.9 gallons. Oops, didn't mean to do that. No, just the same thing again. So 3.101 minus 0.12 is going to be 2.981. Borrowing in your head is hard, at least for me. And where do we need to round it? To the hundredths place. Our largest uncertainty is in the hundredths place. So our final answer would be 2.98 meters. Plug the last one in the calculator, we get 12.19. Everybody can do that one in their head, right? If you can't, you have your calculator. It's okay. But where do we need to round? To the ones place. So it just stays as 12 minutes. That's our friend who called from Placerville to say he was going to be 15 seconds late. It doesn't really change anything. The other way that you can think about that is 
the amount that you're adding is inside the uncertainty that you already had. So it's not really changing anything. At most, you might round up one. Easy enough, right? Not particularly tricky so far. The problem is, is that multiplying and dividing has its own set of rules. Because when you're multiplying and dividing, your uncertainty compounds. Because you, if you have uncertainty on both of your measurements, then the amount that you could be off gets multiplied as well. But it's not as easy as you just take the two uncertainties and multiply them together. So what we do instead is we keep the same number of sig figs as our smallest number of sig figs. And so, and this really matters because when you start doing, you know, multiplication with decimals, you wind up with numbers that look like this. This was supposed to show up one part at a time, so it didn't look like a just a big wall of text. Um, but all we're talking about is if we want to know the volume of a box with these measurements, and the volume of that box is length times width times height. Well, we could be off by 0.01 for each of our measurements, right? If we want to know how off our final number can be, we keep the same number of sig figs. That's what I mean. It shows up way off from where I start writing. Um, as our number that started with the fewest sig figs. So for these three numbers, 12.01 has four sig figs, right? 14.58 is four sig figs. 3.12 is three sig figs. When we multiply these all together, that number that only has three sig figs means our answer can only have three sig figs. Right, so instead of looking at where the decimal place is, it's a matter of how many digits did we write down at the beginning. Right, because you get a ridiculous calculator number, right? That clearly our answer is not plus or minus 0 0.00001, whatever it is. I didn't count my zeros. Point is, it's not, the uncertainty is not that digit. The uncertainty is in the ones place because you can only keep three sig figs. So this is why this will be the thing that I mark you down on more than anything else. It's because you have to be able to look at the math and know which set of rules for rounding you have to use. And that takes a lot of practice. And we'll keep practicing at it. I promise I'm not too harsh, but I will remind you, hey, you were supposed to be paying attention to that. It's a pretty small point penalty generally, unless you give me a number like this. If you box this as your final answer, that tells me you're really not paying attention to uncertainty or sig figs at all. You know, you get a slightly larger deduction. If you just, if you get close, you get one extra digit, then you get a quarter point off. It's not a big deal. Um, small note about the way we write this final answer is we want to say it's 550 plus or minus one. The best way to do that is to use scientific notation. Because if you just write 550, it's unclear whether that's plus or minus one or plus or minus 10, right? So if we wanted to say it's 550 plus or minus one, the best way to do to write that would be not that kind of, 5.50 plus or minus one. Times 10 to the two centimeters cubed. Because if it's in scientific notation, every digit we write is a sig fig. So we're specifically saying all three of these matter and we're keeping them. Just to write 550 centimeters, though, that's a little bit of a pain. So the, the shorthand that is fairly, it's common enough in the scientific world that I will teach it to you now, even though it's not officially correct is if you write the decimal point 
if it's if it's plus or minus one, and especially if that one's place is a zero, writing the decimal point with nothing after that is sort of indicating, hey, my my uncertainty is in the one's place. So this is acceptable. It's not the best way to do it. It's not the official way to do it, but it's allowed because it's common enough and it's a really convenient shorthand because getting numbers like this are fairly common in writing times 10 to the two or times 10 to the one is really a pain. If you want to say 78 plus or minus one, you could write it in scientific notation. It'd be 7.8 times 10 to the one, or you could put the little decimal there and that's indicating just as well. 78 is a bad example because you should already assume that it's plus or minus one, but say it was seven plus or minus one. You could write 7.0 times 10 to the one, or use the, the extra decimal point. It's, it's allowable. If you're ever unsure, just put it in scientific notation because there is no way to do that for the tens place. If you want to say 550 plus or minus 10, there's no way to show that. So you have to do that to the, in scientific notation in that case. So it's not a bad idea to just get really comfortable with scientific notation um, because that's always going to be your fail safe. When in doubt, when it comes to sig figs, put it in scientific notation and you'll, you'll never wind up with an ambiguous number that way. You might get still get the wrong number sig figs, but at least it's not ambiguous. So we have some more practice and then we'll get into tricky practice. So calculator answer for the first one, 7,709.636 feet cubed. How many sig figs do we get to keep? Just two. So we have to round to the hundreds place. So 7,700 plus or minus 100 feet cubed. But that's, if you don't want to write plus or minus 100 feet cubed, this is where scientific notation is your friend, right? 7.7 .7 times 10 to the three feet cubed. Right, and that carries with it that implicit assumption that you're plus or minus 100. Your plus or minus one in that that digit of the second seven.
So really what you're doing with the, with this, keep the same number of sig figs, with multiplication and division, the number of sig figs is a good indication of like, kind of like what percentage of your number is uncertainty. If you only have two sig figs, you could be off by 10% of your complete number, right? This 3.4 feet, if I could be off by a whole 10th, then that's, you know, close to 10% of my total number, which means my final answer, the uncertainty needs to be a 10th of my total number, right? And if you have a number with more sig figs, that means your uncertainty is a smaller percentage of that, that initial number, right? That 187.4, your uncertainty is plus or minus 0.1, which means that's like 0.1% that your, your number could be off roughly. So that means that's a better number. More sig figs is a more precise number and therefore you get to keep more digits when you do math with it. Right? So it's the same principle as keeping the same uncertainty, but because our numbers get so much bigger or smaller, we need to adjust it a little bit to, to account for that. So what's the calculator answer for the top right? A small note about what we do with units, treat units like they're a variable. When you think back to your math, if you are adding two X's together, like three X plus four X, that's seven X, right? And you keep the X is the same because you're adding things that are the same size. If it's, if you're multiplying things together, then the units multiply as well. Just like if it's seven X times three X, the answer is 21 X squared now, right? So for this, for science, for units, you treat the units just like you would treat a variable in an algebra problem. That goes for canceling them out too, which we'll see soon enough. And how many sig figs do we get to keep on this one? Just the two. So 5.5, .5, again, times 10 to the three centimeters squared, not cubed. So what do you do in algebra if you have X over Y? Can you simplify that anymore? Just stays as X over Y, right? No, Well, you could put the Y by itself, but in the case of, I just mean in the case of uh, like treating these like units, um, if we have meters over seconds, we can't really do anything with that when it comes to units. So we just keep it as meters over seconds. So 102.1 meters over 10.0 seconds, the units that you end up with are meters per second. But we only keep three sig figs. So 10.2 meters per second. What do we do if we get the same unit on top and bottom of a fraction? Mathematically, if you have X over X, what happens? X cancels out, right? You get you know, one over one. So what do our units do for 175 pounds over 192.4 pounds? They're gonna cancel each other out. We actually do get a unitless number in this case, which generally means we have to add some context about what that number is. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense as it is right now, 175 pounds over 192.4 pounds. We need some information about that. So if we wanted to actually make this, this number more than just meaningless practice. Um, well, first off, I guess, what do we get for the number? Okay, louder. 0 0.995, give me one more. 90.95, there you go. Let me clean that up. So 
So if I gave you some more information about what these numbers are, maybe that's 175 pounds of water for 192 pounds of body weight, perhaps. Then basically what we're seeing is this: these pounds cancel out pounds, and we're going to get something that's like the, the percentage of the body weight that is water. At least it'd be percentage if we multiplied by 100. We'd say it's 90% water. But without more information about what these pounds are, it's hard to say if it's you know, my, my new body weight divided by my body weight when I started my diet. Then it's this is the percentage of, of body weight that I still have. Right. So sometimes when we do percentages and ratios, especially the units will cancel out and we kind of have to give context by describing the situation a little bit. Because even if I just said, you know, 90%, that still is a meaningless number, right? 90% doesn't mean anything unless you know percent of what. Right. So percent is not going to ever be its own unit, but occasionally we have to ha write a number that doesn't have any units on it and give context through describing it. And we're gonna keep three sig figs in this case, right? So, does that zero to the left of the decimal point, does that count? didn't have to measure it really, right? It's so any leading zeros and leading zeros mean any zeros to the left of your first number, your first non-zero number, aren't gonna count as sig figs. They're just there as placeholder zeros, just like with our, our scientific notation example earlier, right? So if we want three sig figs, it's gonna be those three. And that applies to if we add something like, let me go back to that page with scientific notation. This number right here, a decimite is 0 0.000305 meters. How many sig figs is that? Just three. All of those zeros to the left of the three are just there to say where the decimal point goes. They're not measured numbers. So we're, we're treating both sides of our numbers differently, right? If it's to the right, for your, your right, of the smallest number, then it counts. The only reason to write a zero after the five would be if we're saying that's where the uncertainty is. If it's left of your first non-zero number, then it's not a sig fig. It's just a placeholder. It's just telling you where the decimal point goes. Because otherwise there's not really any limit we could keep adding zeros to the left as much as we wanted, right? And wouldn't change the number. And technically, it's they're, they're all there, but they're not measured. So it doesn't count. All right. Let's do, we're going to skip this one. I'm going to talk about this. We're going to skip this practice problem because it's really kind of a convoluted example. Um, there will be times in this class where you have to mix and match your order of operations, where you have to do math that involves addition and subtraction. And then you have to do math that has multiplication and division or vice versa. And that means you need to know both of these rules and when to switch back and forth between them. Right, so we still need to follow order of operations, which means, you know, that's PEMDAS, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, or however else you learned it. Um, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. And for the purposes of this class, a subtraction is essentially adding a negative number, right? Not essentially, it is adding a negative number. So addition and subtraction are the same operation. And multiplication and division are the same operation. You do them at the same time. They're in, in uh, that order because when you first learn PEMDAS, that's a little bit of a stretch to, for teachers to teach that at the same time. So they teach you that multiplication and division are two different things. They're not. 
division is just multiplying by the, the reciprocal. And subtraction is just adding a negative number. Right? So when we do the order of operations, whatever math you're doing, that's the rule you have to be using. And anytime you switch between rules, anytime you switch between addition, subtraction, and multiplication division, you have to round properly before you can start the next step. Otherwise, it gets way too convoluted to go all the way to the end and then figure out where you're supposed to round with when you've got three different sets of rounding that were supposed to happen. And so we'll come back to that one. So let's come up. There's the best example I can come up with something physical that has both of these operations at the same time. So let's say we've got a room that's roughly the same square footage as this one was before they remodeled it. 32.5 feet wide by 16 feet deep. What's the area of the room with the right number of sig figs? So it'd be, what's the calculator answer? 520 on the nose, okay. So if we wanna keep three sig figs, it'd be 520. We would need to use that, our little decimal point to say that that is plus or minus one, right? Or we could say, put it in scientific notation. And our units are feet squared, right? Okay, easy enough. Our uncertainty is in the ones place after we do the multiplication. The, the uncertainty was in the tenths place and then we multiply. But our uncertainty got bigger too. So we keep three sig figs. Let's say that then they install one of these, these things called a bulkhead. Well, this is really more like a door, but a bulkhead would be like if there was a vent behind it. Um, if we install a bulkhead that takes up 6.00 feet by 1.55 feet, how many square feet did we lose? Nine point, sorry, 9.3. And how many sig figs do we need? Three. So if it's 9.3 exactly, then it's 9.30. What's the new square footage of the room? So 520 plus or minus one minus 9.30. So we get five, 10.7 is our calculator answer, right? But we have to switch rules now. Now we're doing subtraction. So now that we're doing subtraction, we're keeping the same uncertainty as our least certain number. So keep the same decimal points, which would put the uncertainty in what decimal point, what place? The ones. Our 520 was plus or minus one. So after we do the subtraction, we're still plus or minus one. And see how that would get to be really easy to mess up on, especially if you're going fast on a test or you know, in the middle of doing a lab and you're finding a change in temperature and then you're taking a change in temperature and you're multiplying by the mass. Well, change in temperature is subtraction, but then you're switching to multiplying after you do the subtraction. So paying, paying attention to where you're supposed to round becomes tricky, but that's why I'm gonna keep reminding you about it, to be paying attention to it and just don't go overkill on your decimal place. And at most it'll be a small error, a small deduction. Right? because it's really, really hard to get this right every single time, as, as you've seen by watching me mess up at least twice since we've started going on this. And I've been doing this for 
a couple decades now. All right. So that other one that I said we were going to look at was, this was my first attempt to find something that was, um, that had both orders, both operations in them at the same time. And if the race starts a certain distance and ends a certain distance from you and it takes this long, how, what's the average speed? So you start by figuring out what the distance is, which is a subtraction, and then divide by the total time. And you have to pay attention to your order of operations for that. And so if speed is the distance run divided by the time, our distance run is 152 minus 7.4 meters. When we do that subtraction, our calculator answer would be 152 point, or sorry, 144.6, 144.6. But now we're about to switch operations to division. So we need to do our rounding before we do that. So 144.6, we need our uncertainty in the ones place. So it gets rounded to 145. And now we've got three sig figs on the top. And when we divide by four sig figs, now we're switching to counting sig figs because it's division. So 145 meters over 25.17 seconds. Just to finish this out, what do we get for a number? Apologies for the messiness, 5.7605 or something, right? But we're only going to keep three sig figs. Just keep sloping downward. It gets worse. It's not off by the same amount everywhere. In the middle, it's pretty close to right on, but the closer you get to the edges of the screen, the further off it gets. And so as I start kind of sloping downward, it gets worse and worse and harder and harder to account for. So um, I have a, a work order in to try and fix this. I think we just need to update the, the OS a little bit or something or undo an update. Um, that's all beside the point. Point is, lecture's over. Point is, you've all seen this once now. We'll do more practice with it and keep working at it. Don't worry about it for the math review, although you might want to practice it if you, while you're working on the math review if you haven't yet.